Welcome to the Character Chronicles, the People Show. Checking the polls. First creation brought to you by DPS Concrete Construction. Check them out at dpsconstruction.net, also characterchronicles.com. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're like me and you're excited to see what Dana Holgerson can do, even if it's just the tiniest bit to help Nebraska's offense on Saturday, just be a little bit more efficient, decisive, etc. If that's all you want to see, and a Husker win, obviously, smash that like button. And as always, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe, ring that notification bell so you don't miss any of the stuff we're doing here on the Character Chronicles. Ladies and gentlemen, we've kind of settled into a schedule of gut reaction after the game. Sunday night, Tuesday night show every week, 6 p.m. Central Time on YouTube, 7 p.m. Central Time on social media. And the preview and prediction show, much like this one, each and every week for our upcoming opponent, is kind of all over the place. So make sure you subscribe to not miss any of the content we're putting out here. This is USC preview and prediction show, but the back half of this show, is my interview with University of Nebraska President Dr. Gold. And I, he's very intelligent, very accomplished. I knew all of that. You got to check out the interview. It was awesome. It went off in a direction in a good way that I didn't anticipate. And at one point, I was actually kind of fighting back tears a little bit. Just check it out, the back half of this show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, normally I have a ton of stats comparing our team to the upcoming opponent. And I've got some of those. But let's be real, there's so much new. We have a new offensive coordinator, new play caller. They have a new quarterback. There's a bye week for them, a bye week for us. I don't see the. I don't know what's going to happen. There's so much unpredictability. I don't see a whole lot of point looking in the past. But here's a couple of things that I found interesting. USC starting a new quarterback. His name is Jaden Maivea, UNLV transfer. He's got a big arm, good mobility, great zip on the ball, and definitely throws the deep ball. M much better than Miller Moss, their previous quarterback, but he can definitely sling the rock downfield. Now, the Trojans, they're looking for bigger plays. That's what they're looking for going forward. They were 73rd in the country on pass plays of 30-plus yards, 12 they've had this year. Tied for 80th in the country on pass plays of 40-plus yards or more, only five. That's not a Lincoln-Riley offense. Last year, USC was tied for third and second in America in those very same categories. Bench quarterback Miller Moss was struggling. He's more of a system type quarterback and it just wasn't working out, all right? Now USC is looking for an offensive identity of their own. They're talking about, who the heck are we? We gotta find an identity, kinda like Nebraska. All right, their new starting quarterback, Jaden, has a higher ceiling physically, all right? Now Moss was 17 to 39 on pass attempts of 20 plus yards or more for 439 yards, six TDs, and three INTs a year ago. And obviously the competition's a little bit different, but a year ago at UNLV, all right, Mr. Maivea was 19 of 51 for 839 yards, eight TDs, and zero interceptions in that same category with less pass attempts. All right, Miller Moss had 362 uh, so far this year. Last year, Jaden had 353 overall. Jaden Maivea, USC starting quarterback last year, completed 64% of his passes for 3,085 passing yards, 17 TDs, and 10 INTs. Not the touchdown-to-interception ratio you want if you're USC. Maybe Nebraska likes it. Had a quarterback rating of 147. He's a sophomore, 6'4", 220 pounds. All right, he's a big dude. USC is thinking maybe we found our quarterback of the future. Now, I'm calling this the wounded animal game. It's two teams that aren't where exactly they want to be, the season is definitely not over. You've had people taking shots at you, scrutinizing you. You're in the corner. You're a wounded animal, and you're going to meet. Somebody's going to win this game and feel really good about it, and somebody's going to have to get back on track afterwards. It's the wounded animal game. Who's going to come out fighting, fighting, scratching, clawing, gouging in the eye, kicking in the, you know, in a football sense. All right. Both head coaches, big name head coaches under, under high scrutiny. USC is four and five. All five of their losses, check this, Nebraska fans, all five of their losses are by one score, and they led in the fourth quarter of each and every one of those games, and they found a way to lose. All right, I'm going to read Bed Pe Bud Pettigrew. Shout out to him. All right, he connected me with Dr. Gold. But he said, he texted me, do you think we'll put in any air raid blocking schemes for some air raid packages and or throwing the ball? Or is Dana H. learning the current playbook and out scheming opponents? Hopefully that'd be great. I think, and I responded, I think Dana will learn their playbook, simplify it, then add a couple of wrinkles of his own. So to simplify, to make it easier, less of the plays we've been running, then add a wrinkle or two during the bye week of his own. Nothing crazy, but also give USC something they haven't seen before. I don't see a point in going into a lot of offensive stats with a new OC and a new play caller, but I am curious to see what he's going to do differently potentially with the personnel. Does Malachi Coleman play? 
All right, what's he do differently potentially with Emmett Johnson, Jalen Lloyd? All right, Ja'Cory Barney, how's he going to utilize him? Obviously the quarterback position too, but here's my keys to the game. Number one, I'm actually going to start with the defense, okay? We're a top 15 defense, and the only reason we're not a top five defense is consistency. Rough half here, rough quarter there, so to speak. 36 quarters we played this year. They played 28 quarters of good football. Can they be consistent? Can they prevent the deep ball? That's what USC is looking for. Can they make them consistently move the chains? And then can we get off the field? Consistently prevent the big play. Consistently get off the field on third downs. Much better than the UCLA game. The offense, can you be more decisive? Can you move a little faster? Can you be more efficient? In other words, can you do the little things better? Which is what Matt Rule has emphasized this past week in practice. Number three, we need to run the ball. Holgerson's offenses throughout his 16 years as a head coach and OC have averaged 173 rush yards per game. USC had a D lineman after four games, red shirt this year, one of their starters, and they only have two defensive linemen of 300 plus pounds or more. USC is a nine and a half point favorite. I kind of don't, am I missing something? Like they've lost at Maryland. They lost to Minnesota on a fourth and goal with one minute to go in the game. This is a talented team. This isn't a juggernaut. How anybody has any idea of what's going to happen in this game is beyond me. But how you, fine, favor USC. And maybe USC wins by 10 or 14 points. By the way, check out Dr. Gold's prediction at the end of this. You're going to like it. Maybe they win by 10 or 14 points. But how do you set that as the spread? This game is so unpredictable. I kind of don't understand it. Maybe I'm missing something. All right, again, they're very talented. But they're still four and five. All right, I have no idea what's going to happen. I do believe this will be a one-score game, and somebody's got to win it between these two teams. Here's my prediction. A little bit of heart. A little bit of, I was going to say brains, but mostly heart. I think the offense is a little cleaner. The special teams just stays out of the way. And the score, I'm predicting USC 24, Nebraska 27. And ladies and gentlemen, all right, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, DPS Concrete Construction. Check them out at dpsconstruction.net. They're your concrete and retaining wall experts. Also, Bonzel Pool and Spa. Check them out at bonzelpool.com. They have hot tubs, saunas, pools. They did my family's hot tub, my family's pool, and they take care of them. Go ask for Jeff if you go in store. Otherwise, bonzelpool.com. Check it out. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm proud, had to be happy to be joined by our special guest. All right, he is and or has been all the things I'm about to mention. That is a thoracic surgeon who specializes in adult and pediatric cardiac surgery, the Chancellor of Nebraska Medical Center. While he was there, he was in charge of a budget of over $740 million and a staff of about 5,000 people. As of July 1st, he is the president of the University of Nebraska, which has almost 50,000 students. Mr. Dr. Jeffrey Gold. How you doing, my friend? I couldn't be any better. Glad to be with you today. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. And we'll, we'll ask a couple of football questions here in, in about four or five minutes. But first, there was a, a little bit of a lengthier process to you becoming the president. And I'm just after Ted Carter's departure. And I'm just kind of curious what that process was like for you and just kind of that whole process for you? Well, it actually took about the same time that it took to hire Ted, uh, you know, four or five years ago. Uh, and it's not an atypical process in terms of what academic search is like. Be, if you add in all the listening sessions, the vetting, the all the candidate pools. And, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person that wanted to sit mm. in this chair today and be the leader of this great university system. But for me, it was a time to reflect, to talk with my family and my closest friends, to really come to a decision as to what I really wanted to do at this stage of my life. And uh, we came collectively to a unanimous decision that would be uh, myself and my family and literally hundreds, if not thousands of stakeholders. I got over 1,500 emails, texts, letters, signed petitions, et cetera, of people that really encouraged me to do this. But this was the right time and the right place and was a, a good fit for what my vision was for the future of not just the University of Nebraska, but for the state and for the region. And obviously, you know, the way things kind of happened with, with Trev Alberts going back in time, that was a little bit tumultuous. But now Troy Dan is the athletic director. Obviously, he's been here a while. He's got a great vision. And I'm excited to see what he can do. But as you've gotten to know Troy Dannon, what's that process been like for you getting to know the new AD here at Nebraska? 
Well, first of all, I worked with Trev very closely during my four years when I was at the chancellor of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. So I knew Trev quite well and appreciated him greatly. But I've gotten to know Troy quite well also. You know, we have traveled together. Uh, we have uh, we communicate, you know, frequently uh, as much as once or twice a day. And I've just developed an incredible amount of respect for the gentleman, for his values, for his love of athletics, but also for his caring for the student athletes. He's also a very accomplished businessman and, you know, mm -hmm. understands that uh, athletics, of course, is all about performance and sport. It's all about the individual student athletes, but it's also a business and you need to keep the trains running on time. And he, uh, I think, has uh, really got that in just the right balance. All right. I got to ask, because you, you've got a lot of responsibility, obviously. A lot of people have your back and, and wanted you to be sitting in the seat you're in for obvious reasons. But what's the most difficult part about being the president of the University of Nebraska? Well, you know, people ask me all the time what keeps me up at night, which I guess is uh, what you're asking me, Adam. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I like the phrase, I sleep like a baby. I get up every hour screaming. Uh, that's not exactly <laughs> true. But uh, there are some nights that, uh, that are like that. I would say that the biggest challenges that we really have right now is establishing priorities. We have an incredibly excellent university system, multiple campuses, great leaders. But we really need to get some focused priorities, focused priorities in academia in terms of the uh, uh, academic programs that students will know us for across the country. Uh, and the same thing is true in our research expertise, and they are connected as well. You know, we need and have broad and deep research, discovery, and creative activity programs. You know, everything from healthcare to engineering to, you know, physics and you know, fill in the blank, uh, mm -hmm. business, uh, et cetera, many, many, many more. But we should identify what some of those pinnacles are so we can invest in those pinnacles and become better known for them. Same thing true in research, because that way we can continue to recruit uh, talented research scientists in focused areas that will just continue to build our national reputation. So what are some of the things on the horizon for the University of Nebraska that people should keep an eye out for, that they should be excited for then? Well, win a few more football games would be a, a no, great no. step, of course. Yeah, no, no. But, you know, uh, I love women's sports, and I've been attending almost all. I think I've missed only two of the home volleyball games uh, since the season has begun. But on a much broader picture, we are focused. Our North Star is the journey from excellent to extraordinary and defining what extraordinary means, not only on the hardwood and on the gridiron, but in the classroom and the research laboratory, and then adjusting the culture, building the culture uh, of people that believe that they can truly be extraordinary. You know, uh, Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can do something or you think that you can't, you're almost certainly right. Mm -hmm. I profoundly believe that. I've seen that over and over and over again. And I believe deep down inside, this is an extraordinary organization, and we need a culture that continues to reach for that extraordinary level of performance. All right. So on a more personal level, I'm curious, do you hunt, fish, do you go camping? Is that something you've done in the past? Or what's just something you'd like people to know about you to get to know you a little bit more personally? So I have uh, fished a good deal. I don't do much uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, I used to play some golf uh, at some time, but I'm probably more dangerous to the course than, uh, than anything else. My wife and I are major collectors. And here's a little known fact about me is that for many, many years, uh, I collect and restore antique fountain pens and oh, okay. uh, always write with an antique fountain pen. So when I sign a letter, everybody knows I've signed it because it's signed in a calligraphy mode uh, with a wet ink fountain pen. Oh, that is very interesting. All right. Very cool. All right. Getting into a little bit more of the football, the sports oriented side of things specifically. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's been kind of an up and down year for Coach Rule for the football team. Obviously, a big opportunity this Saturday versus USC to get a win, yeah. get bowl eligible. But what are your thoughts on Matt Rule and his tenure so far as he uh, closes off year two? 
Well, there's no question. Every interaction I've ever had with him, I've been impressed with his professionalism. Uh, I've actually watched him interact with student athletes. Uh, he and I communicated recently about a family matter for one of the student athletes that was dealing with a health problem. Uh, actually, it was not the athlete. It was the parent of the athlete. And his caring for that young man as a human being, as almost parentally, uh, was truly remarkable to me. And so uh, he says all the right things. Uh, I, I know how committed he is to football and to the sport and to the dedication to the legacy. You know, I've spoken at length with uh, Coach Osborne uh, about uh, the program, and I know he believes uh, uh, in Matt strongly as well. But at the end of the day, you know, we have every tool in the tool chest to be a championship team. And, uh, and, and, you know, this is something that I'd like to see, of course, every Nebraskan and many, many others, hundreds of thousands of alumni would, would like to see that as well. But I do understand that it's a journey. All right. So I don't know how familiar you are with Dana Holgerson, the new offensive coordinator here at Nebraska, at least through the rest of this season. But obviously a change in the OC position, a new play caller. What are you looking forward to seeing on Saturday at USC and the rest of the year, the longer Holgerson is here when it comes to Nebraska's offense and, you know, what may or may not be different? Yeah, well, you know, everything I read and, I, you know, as a recovering heart surgeon, I would never profess excellence or expertise in these uh, areas. So I'll try very hard not to. But everything I read and everything I've seen says that the D-line is performing pretty uh, darn well and that we really need to get the offensive uh, play calling uh, and performance uh, up to the same level uh, as the defense uh, has been. You know, uh, I've read about his uh, experience elsewhere and his, you know, uh, his affinity for the air game as opposed to their ground game and, and whether that will turn out to be something that will be important to us. You know, I leave that to him and to Coach Rule. You know, I'll stick to the areas that I know and I'll let them do their business. No, that makes perfect sense. I'm curious about... Because you've obviously seen young, talented people, whether it be in football, whether it be in the medical field or otherwise, I'm sure, several times in your life. We obviously have a young, talented quarterback. All right, when, when you watch, if you're just watching the Nebraska football game, when you watch Dylan Raiola, knowing he's young, knowing he's talented and the future is potentially very bright for him, what are your thoughts as you, as you watch Dylan Raiola progress throughout this season? You know, I'm excited to watch that progression. I've had the opportunity to meet his family on several occasions. Uh, actually, we sat together uh, during the Ohio State game uh, out in Columbus uh, recently, uh, which was quite an experience uh, for me to, to do that. Uh, I think his future is incredibly bright. Uh, I, you know, he just needs the right coaching and the right play calling to uh, to live that future. But you know, I've mentored an awful lot of uh, young women and young men in careers in healthcare and in many other careers, uh, and it's a journey for them too. You know, there are ups and downs. There's an emotional aspect to this. Of course, there's a physical performance aspect to it. You know, I think about, you know, my 25 years in the operating room. I mean, that is a pretty demanding uh, experience. It's extremely intense. It sometimes goes six, eight, or 10 hours in a clip. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a team-based sport, without a doubt. You know, I, so I've told people uh, being a cardiac surgeon, particularly taking care of young kiddos, uh, you know, you're only as good as the weakest link in your team. Uh, and, uh, and so when I see uh, young men like Dylan progress, uh, you know, having been an, ed an educator and a mentor for literally decades of my life, I know there'll be good days and bad days. And, you know, hopefully in the operating room, they're all good days. And hopefully, uh, you know, on the gridiron, they're all good days, but it is going to ebb and flow. And we need the patience to watch him develop into the athlete of the future. So I've got to ask about being a surgeon. I've had 11 surgeries. Um, I actually, you're going to be very familiar with this. I had AFib and I had to be shocked back into normal rhythm a couple of times. So what's it like? Because I remember being wheeled into these surgeries and I'm like, man, if, if they hit the wrong thing, what are they going to screw up? And it's like early in the morning sometimes and I'm just sleeping eventually. You guys are doing all the work. But what's that like in the middle of surgery, knowing that the margin for error is so razor, razor thin? We think it's thin on the football field. It's even more thin uh, when you're doing surgery. What's that like? 
Yeah, and don't forget that a lot of these procedures that I did, if not all of them, were literally life and death procedures. Mm -hmm. When you hold yep. some patient's heart in their hand and you stop their heart, you know, long enough to repair or replace a valve or replace a defect or fix a defect that some uh, infant was uh, born with. Mm -hmm. uh, these are very high stress, very demanding fields. But, you know, in many ways, it's, it's like collegiate and professional athletics is you practice and you practice and you practice. You rehearse these instances, these cases over and over again. You work with a team of people that you trust and trust you. And you uh, show up in your very best form every day. You know, I can't tell you how many operations I've canceled over my career because let's say I was up two nights in a row doing a transplant or something of that nature. Yep. You know, the I would always ask myself the question, if this was my kiddo or my loved one going to surgery, uh, would I really want me in that condition or any other member of the team to, you know, have to take their life in their hands? And I, you know, obviously... We don't have that kind of flexibility with the football schedule, but we certainly have the flexibility of who goes out on the field, how long they play for, uh, et cetera. And, you know, in six or eight or 10, I've even done 12 and 16 hour operations. Uh, sometimes you work in shifts. Sometimes you swap out team members, uh, you know, and it's, it's really all about performance. It's about bringing out the best, you know, whether it's on the uh, hardwood or whether it's on the gridiron or whether it's similar to, a, I like to think about it as being a symphony orchestra or a ballet, that you have rehearsed these moves over and over and over again. You know, and the other interesting piece about it uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, I've, I've thought a lot about is uh, what do you do when you don't win? You know, I can tell you when you don't win in football, that's an opportunity for the coaches and the trainers uh, to play the tapes and, and, and think it through. Uh, when you don't win in the operating room, uh, sometimes it's pretty hard to get up and go back to the operating room the next day and do it all over again. But that's what it takes to have that stamina and to be absolutely sure that you're at the top of your performance uh, every single day that you do that. And sometimes, you know, if I go back to my clinical history, I would do two or three or even four surgeries uh, in a day. Uh, and, uh, you know, quite physically demanding as well as emotionally demanding. But I'll tell you this, uh, of all the joy in my life, when you go down to that family waiting room and tell some parent of a young child that the surgery was successful and their child's going to grow up and, uh, you know, play volleyball for Nebraska. Uh, let me tell you, when they throw their arms around you and, and thank you, there's nothing like it in the world. So we've had a couple of scares with our kiddos, and one of them was actually our oldest daughter, Addison. She's now 13. Before she was born, and you're going to weigh more about this, but they saw like a coarctation of the heart. And they mm -hmm. told us as soon as she was born, like it was 2 a.m., there was like 15 people in the room as soon as she's born, she's going to have to go away for heart surgery. So we were all prepared for this. And they said right after she was born, we want to do one more test. And it looked clear. And they waited 48 hours and they did it again. And they said it was clear. And I'm like, are you sure? Because they had told me if, you know, like three months earlier, when they, we thought we we're going to have to have the surgery, you would have walked in one day and found a blue baby had we not caught this. And I'm like, are you sure it's cleared? I don't, I don't want to find that one day. Here we are 13 years later, there's no scar anywhere. And I don't know if you can tell, I'm trying to fight back tears right now just thinking about it. But no, I, I, it, it's been cool to oh, chat. I cannot with you. tell you how many neonatal coarctations of the aorta I have fixed in my life. Yeah. And uh, frankly, uh, you know, retrospectively, I don't think I've ever lost a single one. Uh, it's nothing you really want to go through as a parent, particularly of a newborn. Uh, and the good news is, is that prenatal diagnosis has gotten more and more accurate. But I mean, these are kids before the advent of these surgical procedures mm -hmm. who had no prognosis. Every one of them would have died. Uh, and now it's almost, a, you know, not quite a hundred percent success rate, but most of these kids grow up, live perfectly normal lives. You know, it's really great that your daughter didn't need to go through this and that, that your family didn't need to go through this. Because let me tell you, it's a family journey. It's not just about mm -hmm. the kid and there's nothing easy about it. But the good news is, is that modern medicine has progressed to the point today in modern surgery that uh, as traumatic as it may be, uh, these are cured. 
Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool because now she has a dream of playing volleyball in Nebraska one day, potentially. She's also qualified for nationals and track. And there was a point in time we didn't know if she'd be able to do sports. So this is kind of a unique transition here. But I got one last question for you, because, sure. of course, I've got to get your prediction for Nebraska versus USC. You can give a score prediction or just who you think is going to win. Nebraska is going to win. I like it. Decisive and quick. That was awesome. Absolutely. Uh by at least seven points and maybe 10. Ooh, I really like it. I really like it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, you can go to characterchronicles.com. It's where all your Husker sports hopes and dreams will come true. I have three questions for you fine folks at home. Number one, what's your score prediction? All right, for Nebraska versus USC. Number two, what's your single biggest key to Nebraska beating the Huskers? And number three, do you have any sort of similar kind of medical mir miracle stories, stories, whether it be your family or someone you know, you can always share it in the comments below. I want to thank Dr. Gold for joining me. And Dr. Gold, all right, you want to give the, the, the Husker fans a big throw the bones or we'll close the show yeah. that way? Let's do it. Throw the bones. Throw the bones.